And now we're back to finish up our final 16th episode of the Eduardo series, where we're answering questions and comments about whether or not we are to keep God's law given through Moses. And now we have a comment from Debbie. She says that, Paul says that we no longer observe days, months, times, holy days, and Sabbaths anymore. Alright, well Debbie here is referring to a verse from Galatians where Paul mentions days, months, times, and years, and a verse from Colossians where Paul talks about holy days, new moons, and Sabbath days. Let's start with Galatians 4, 8 through 11. Howbeit then, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. So here Paul is talking about before the Galatians knew God, they used to worship false gods. But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? Ye observe days and months and times and years. I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. These days, months, times, and years that the Galatians are turning back to are pagan days, months, times, and years. They had nothing to do with God's law. Now let's see what Paul says in Colossians 2.16. Let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of an holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days. The holy days, new moons, and Sabbath days are biblical. God commands his people to observe these days. And if you look at the context of Colossians 2, Paul is telling the Colossian believers not to let pagan philosophers and angel worshippers judge them wrongfully for keeping what God commands his people in the scriptures. And we know from the prophets that in the future millennial reign, and in the new heavens and the new earth, we'll still be keeping the new moon, sabbaths, and feast days. So it doesn't make sense to say that we don't keep these days anymore, because the Bible prophesies that we will still be keeping them in the future. Someone known only as California has this comment. Jesus is our high priest now. A lot of people have trouble understanding where the Levitical priesthood fits now, since obviously the New Testament tells us that Jesus from the tribe of Judah, and that Levi, is our great high priest. This is all addressed back in episode 9c if you'd like to check that out. But to give a quick answer, Jesus is the high priest in the heavenly tabernacle. The law tells us that the priests of the earthly tabernacle have to be of the sons of Aaron from the tribe of Levi. Which is why Hebrews 8.4 tells us if Jesus were on earth, he should not be a priest. Because Jesus is from the tribe of Judah, and the priests of the earthly sanctuary are supposed to be from Levi. But there is no such requirement in the heavenly tabernacle. So it's perfectly legal for Jesus to be a priest, after a different order, in a different tabernacle. And we don't have to get rid of the law to allow for Jesus' priesthood, because he's the high priest, not of the earthly, but the heavenly tabernacle. Here's a comment now from Ken. He says, we don't keep the law anymore, just read Galatians. Well, in this series, we've addressed in several episodes what Paul actually teaches in the book of Galatians, concerning things like the curse of the law, the schoolmaster, bondage, days, months, times, and years, and the circumcision. And none of what Paul says in Galatians proves that we shouldn't keep the law. And if you think that any of what Paul says in Galatians allows you to be without the law now, that's a classic example of what Peter warns us about in 2 Peter 3, 15-17 about using what Paul says, misunderstanding what Paul says, to fall into the error of lawlessness. In Galatians, Paul teaches that we, by faith, are no longer under the law of sin and death, that we're cursed if we don't continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. He warns against reverting back to paganism, observing the times of the heathen, and of the bondage of those who are of the circumcision, following the traditions and doctrines and commandments of men. We also need to remember that Galatians is a letter, we need to read the beginning of the letter before we assume anything about the middle or end of it. And in the beginning of this letter, Paul says that even if he or an angel preach another gospel than what Paul already preached, let him be accursed. And before Galatians, Paul already preached in favor of the law. And in chapter 2, Paul tells us that he checked with the other apostles to make sure what he was preaching was correct, lest he should run or had run in vain. And sure enough, what he preached, which he said he received by revelation of Jesus Christ, was the same thing the apostles preached, and Paul says all he preached was nothing but Moses and the prophets, which is what Jesus preached, and what Peter and the other apostles preached. So yes, read Galatians, but be sure you keep it in context, and test everything Paul says to the whole of scripture like the Bereans did. Next we have a comment from Larry. Larry says, As a believer and follower of Christ, we are to do good works, but it is not Christ plus works that saves you. When Christ came, he completed or abolished the law. Back in episode 5, we addressed what actually was abolished, and what the Bible says will never be abolished. 
We learned from both Deuteronomy 6 and Isaiah 51 that righteousness is connected to God's law and keeping his commandments. And Isaiah says that God's righteousness, which he equates with his law, shall not be abolished, and it shall be forever. And in 2 Corinthians 3, if we read it in context, we understand that our stony hearts and the veil over our hearts and our blinded minds are what is abolished. There is no clear verse that says that God's law was abolished, and the whole of Scripture teaches us the exact opposite, that God's law is forever, never to be abolished. And now we have a comment from Phyllis. She says, We are not under the law. I am saved by grace through faith. It's true that we are saved by grace, but grace does not replace the law. The grace of God is found all through the Old Testament, and it's even in the law itself that God declares that he is gracious. And Paul says in Romans 3.31, Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. It's also true that Paul says that we are no longer under the law, but we always need to remember to ask and to look at the context and compare it to the whole of Scripture to determine what law Paul is talking about when he says the law, because Paul mentions at least eight different laws. And for some reason, we just automatically assume Paul is talking about God's law while we fall into the trap of 2 Peter 3, 15-17. Another comment we've received is this. We can pick whatever day we want as the Sabbath, as long as you work six days and rest on one. Romans 14. Well, let's read Romans 14. This idea this person has comes from verses 5-6. through six. But let's start in verses 2-3 through three to get some more context. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day to the Lord who doth not regard it. He that eateth eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks, and he that eateth not to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. The context of this passage is talking about eating and not eating, and regarding days to eat and not eat on. There was a debate going on at this time about which days of the week to fast on. This has nothing to do with the Sabbath. In fact, the word Sabbath is found nowhere in Romans 14, or even in the entire book of Romans. This passage has to do with fasting and which days to fast on. And there's nothing in the law that says when to fast except the Day of Atonement. What each man should be fully persuaded about in his own mind is what day he's decided to fast on. Besides, we should already be fully persuaded by reading the scriptures that the Sabbath is above every other day. And the commandment is not that we work any random six days and we can pick which random one to rest on. We are supposed to rest on the seventh day of the week, which has always been on Saturday, not Sunday or any other day we may like. The New Testament even shows us this in Matthew 28, 1. In the end of the Sabbath... As it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. Everyone knows that Jesus rose from the dead on Sunday, the first day of the week. And here Matthew tells us that Sunday is the day after the Sabbath. Here's one now from Tim. He says, Paul only kept the law when it suited his purposes. God changing the law has nothing to do with God not changing. He planned on changing from the beginning. Now if God didn't change like he planned to, then that would be a change. Well, alright, that's an interesting one, but let's read some verses concerning how God changes not. Malachi 3.6 For I am the Lord, I change not. In Hebrews 13.8 Jesus Christ, the same, yesterday and today and forever. In Hebrews 1.10-12 And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as doth the garment, and as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. Clearly the Bible teaches that God does not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The way he was in the past is how he is today, which is how he'll be forevermore. The Bible also says that the word of God endureth forever. Jesus said in Luke sixteen seventeen, And it is easier for heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of the law to fail. A true search of the scripture shows that neither God, nor his word, nor the law has changed. God says in Psalm 89.34, My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. Now about Paul only keeping the law when it suited his purposes, 
I can't find a verse that says anything like that. Instead, I find verses that tell us that what Paul and the apostles did was for examples for us. Look at Philippians 3.17. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so, as ye have us for an ensample. Every time Paul kept the Sabbath, every time he kept the feast days, every time he and the apostles are teaching people to do things that only come from the law, it's all for our example or ensample. What other reason would Paul have to go out of his way and voluntarily take a Nazarite vow and pay for 15 animal sacrifices to be made in the temple on behalf of himself and four other men than to prove to everyone that he himself intentionally keeps God's law given through Moses? There's no getting around it that when you actually search the scriptures, Jesus kept the law, the apostles kept the law, and they taught others to keep the law as well. Now here's a comment from Mr. Doughton. He says, Much of what you talk about is no longer what we are held to. We are in the age of grace, not the age of the law as they were in the Old Testament. We are not held to the same standard related to swine. The key factor is to first be saved, then follow God's will. The standard is what was left by Christ. Love one another as I have loved you. I agree we must first be saved and then follow God's will. But what does the Bible say God's will is? Psalm 40 verse 8 I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. There are no different dispensations of the age of the law and the age of grace. As we mentioned already, grace is found all through the Old Testament. And also, the law is found all through the New Testament. The standard left by Christ was to walk in God's law, keeping the commandments, walking as Jesus walked. When he said, love one another as I have loved you, he loved us the way he says to in the law, just like John says in 1 John 5 too. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. The standard we are held to is the same one God gave to Moses, the same one Jesus walked out, and the same one the apostles followed and taught. And it's the law of God given through Moses. And now here's our last comment from Pastor David. He says, I am righteous by what Christ has done on the cross for me, not whether I obey the law or not. Well, let's look at some New Testament verses about righteousness. Luke 1 6, talking about Zacharias and Elizabeth, and they were both righteous before God, how? Walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. And look at 1 John 3 7. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. So John says that we're righteous if we do righteousness. And what is righteousness? Deuteronomy 6.25 and it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God, as he hath commanded us. The law shows us how God wants us to be righteous. It shows us the difference between righteousness and sin. 1 John 3, 4 says that sin is the transgression of the law. And opposite of that, as we just read in Deuteronomy 6, is our righteousness if we do the commandments. So, yes, you are righteous if you obey the law. Otherwise, if you don't obey it, you're sinning. I think we've answered virtually every reason that people give for why they choose not to keep God's law given through Moses. And we've done it by looking at the context of these key verses, by searching the scriptures, by comparing what Jesus and the apostles said with the entirety of scripture. Just like the Bereans of Acts 17.11 tested everything Paul said to the scriptures to see whether those things were so. So let's hear from Pastor Wardo one last time all his grand reasons for why we don't keep the law of Moses. And so the law that we're reading about today in the Old Testament wasn't given to us. That's why we don't keep it. And so why do we not keep the law of Moses? Because it's been fulfilled. We're dead to it. We've been delivered from it. That's why we don't keep it. And so the Old Testament law was not written for our doing. See? Something in 2 Corinthians 3 was done away and abolished. What was it? It was the Old Testament. Well, if this was the only passage that you had read about the law, what would you understand about it? That it was just temporary. It's not designed to be a permanent thing. If the law was a schoolmaster and we're no longer under a schoolmaster, then what's the conclusion? No longer under the law. It couldn't be any plainer, could it? And so that's pretty clear, is it not? that the Old Covenant has been done away and the New Covenant is binding. I'll tell you another reason though why we don't keep the law of Moses. And that is because of the 
consequences if we do. And so a tenth reason as to why we don't keep the law of Moses is because of the fact that it's been blotted out, taken out of the way, and nailed to the cross. That's strange language, isn't it? If the Old Testament is to be observed today, why don't we keep the law of Moses? Because it's just a shadow. Why go back and keep the law of Moses when we have a better testament? Doesn't make any sense, does it? So if you are under the law, you can't be perfect. If you're trying to keep the law of Moses, you'll never be perfect. See? And so it was the death of Christ on the cross that took away the old law, the old covenant, and ushered in the new covenant. So why don't we keep the law of Moses? Because we have a different law again. Fifteen reasons as to why we don't keep the law of Moses. In reality, not one of Pastor Wardo's reasons for why we don't keep the law of Moses is biblically accurate or even a good reason not to keep God's law. Every one of his proof texts can be turned around and placed back in context to prove that we actually should keep God's law given through Moses. But this series isn't really about Pastor Wardo or what he believes. It's about you. You've seen how Pastor Wardo uses Paul's writings to show that we don't keep the law anymore, how he falls into the very trap that Peter warns us about in 2 Peter 3, 15-17, that we can fall into the error of lawlessness if we misunderstand Paul if we're unstable in the scriptures. In this series, we've learned that the law was given to Israel, God's people, which includes the strangers and includes you if you're a child of God. Jesus did not fulfill everything in the law and the prophets, he only came to fulfill that which was written of him, and fulfill means to do, to perform, to accomplish, not to abolish or to do away with. When Paul says that we're dead to the law, we need to know what law he's talking about before we automatically assume that he's talking about God's law. The law and the prophets and all of scripture was written for our learning and admonition, so that we learn from the examples and examples throughout the Bible where those who broke God's law and rebelled against them were cursed or afflicted or sent into the pit. These are examples for us that we shouldn't reject God's law like they did. When Paul talks about fleshly tables of the heart versus tables of stone, he's quoting from Ezekiel chapters 11 and 36, where God takes away our heart of stone and gives us a heart of flesh and causes us to walk in his statutes and commandments because we now have a heart to do it. The law was added because of transgressions. The law was given to show us our sin till the seed of God's word is planted in our hearts and we have a desire to keep the commandments that at first we broke. And when Paul says that we're no longer under the law, we need to figure out by context what law he's talking about and understand that we're no longer under the law of sin and death that dwelt in our members. And now we should delight in the law of God after the inward man. We also need to understand that when Paul talks about the two covenants, we need to figure out which two covenants he's talking about, because there are several covenants throughout the Bible. And God is faithful to keep covenant with those that love him and keep his commandments, just as Abraham did. Though we might think that there are certain consequences if we keep the law, mostly because we don't really understand what Paul and the apostles are saying in the New Testament, the Bible actually shows that the consequences or the curses come when we don't keep God's law. We must also remember why Jesus came to die. It was not to nail the law to the cross, but instead to blot out our sins and transgressions and trespasses. And just as the feast days of Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and Pentecost were a shadow of Jesus' first coming as the Lamb of God to die and rise again to save the lost sheep of the house of Israel and to send his Spirit to write the law in our hearts, so the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles, along with the Sabbath and New Moons, are a shadow of his second coming with the sound of a trumpet to rule and reign for a thousand years, and then we'll worship before God at every New Moon and every Sabbath for eternity. And just because there's a new covenant doesn't mean that God changed all the rules. The new covenant is all about God writing his law that he gave to Moses in our new hearts of flesh, so that we now want to keep it. And if we keep God's perfect law that converts the soul, following the perfect example of our Messiah who kept the law perfectly, that's how we'll be perfect too, because the testator died to save his people from their sin of breaking the law. And now, because his death brought in the new covenant with Israel and Judah, we can now have the law written in our hearts and no longer commit the same things that put Jesus on the cross. Because we now follow his law, the same one he gave to Moses. 
the same one that Jesus told us to keep if we want to be great in the kingdom, if we want to enter the gates of the new Jerusalem, and if we want to be blessed. So what reason do you have left to not keep God's law given through Moses? We've answered all the reasons people give for why they don't do what God commands us to do in the law, and all those reasons fail the test of scripture. There is no good reason for why you shouldn't keep the law, and there's every reason why you should keep it. What reason can you possibly have not to do what God says to do? It's in your Bible. The only possible reason left that you wouldn't keep God's law is revealed by Jesus himself, and once again he's quoting from the prophets. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. And if you think that that doesn't count now since Jesus said that before the cross, Paul said the same thing in Acts 28, 25-27. Well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people and say, Hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and not perceive. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. The only reason left, according to Jesus and Paul, that you wouldn't keep God's law, even though the entire Bible, Old and New Testaments, shows us repeatedly that we should, is if you have no heart to do it, if you have no eyes to see it, and if you have no ears to hear it. Jesus said in John 6.44, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. The only reason you wouldn't keep his law is if you have no eyes to see, no ears to hear, no heart to understand. God is the only one who can draw you to himself. Only he can open your eyes and ears, and only he can take away the stony heart out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh with his law written in it. But no longer is there any excuse, no misinterpreted verse, and no good reason for you not to keep the law of God. Before we go, I want to give you a few more verses that show just how important it is to keep God's law. Proverbs 4.2 For I give you good doctrine, forsake ye not my law. Proverbs 6.23 For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. Proverbs 28.4 They that forsake the law praise the wicked, but such as keep the law contend with them. Proverbs 28.9 He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be abomination. Proverbs 29.18 Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Isaiah 8.20 To the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. The Bible says that the law is light. It's life. It's good doctrine. If we forsake the law, if we refuse to do what it says because we think it's nailed to the cross and done away with, then we have no light in us, and even our prayers are an abomination before God. So what will you do? With all this information and all these verses that people twist from Paul now answered biblically, will you now choose to follow what God commands us in his law? Throughout the entire Bible, God continually tells us to keep his law. It's for your blessing. It's life. There's absolutely no reason not to keep it. So the only biblical conclusion I can come up with from scripture is that we should keep the law of Moses.